an hour. Then they hit the highways. In the days ahead, the military says it will bring in 7,000 troops, 400,000 packaged meals, 10,000 gallons of bottled water, 50,000 blankets, medical supplies, tents, and bedding. What we're doing here is we're helping Americans. What they also were doing was trying to show the people of Florida that Washington cared about them. The first Army food kitchen quickly became a giant photo op. Reporters and camera crews outnumbered both the Army personnel and the people looking for a hot meal. Military and Washington officials mingled and offered themselves up for interviews. We are looking to meet the immediate needs of these citizens. They need water, they need food, and yes, they need shelter. But the fact is, private donations have taken care of food and water and most other staples very nicely. Although lines today were long, most people were in fairly good spirits, given what they've been through. Who lost their house? Yeah. You lost your house? Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. So where are you living now? With my parents. We had about three families in one house at one time. So. How's your baby making out? He's doing all right. Yeah. We need some dog food. The dogs don't have any food. We're going to be eating them if they... <laughs> well, at least you've got your sense of humor, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good. Meantime, back at the Army food kitchen, a broken part delayed the first hot meal for two hours. A few yards away, a private donor who had driven through the night handed out cartons of staples to people waiting for their meal. When the Army did start serving, it was the shortest line in town. Almost everyone we talked to said they were really glad that the Army had arrived, but what they need now is not so much food and water and clothing, it's shelter, Stone. Mike, what, what seems to be the problem with those meals? Well, you know, I don't think that service meals have changed very much. Um, over here, over uh, my left shoulder, there is uh, one of those food kitchens. There's another one that I visited also in Homestead today. And as I said, those are really tiny lines. And one of the reasons is that you've got a lot of private food that is being donated. Right over here, you can see water bottles. There's a church group that's distributing food there. So unless you have to eat an army meal, I think people are deciding they'll take something else. Okay. Mike Jensen, thank you. Well, from the pictures we've been seeing of Andrew's aftermath, you might think that all of South Florida was devastated, but that's not the case. Most of the 180,000 homeless, one out of every 10 people in Dade County, live south of Miami. Among the hardest hit suburbs, Country Walk, a small subdivision 15 miles away. NBC's Bob Dotson reports. See on the roof up there, that's all, that's completely out. Oh, God. Blew right off. <laughs> Half of this stuff was all over here. This doesn't be tall. There ought to be a mid-life insurance company. I gotta get out of here. <laughs> Our wedding picture. Nick and Maureen Pascarella would rather forget their 13th year in Florida. Last year we lost our business. We worked so hard for two years. The business, now we're home. And then to lose this? I worked for Zen Mazda in US 1. No job either. How could so many things happen in one year to one person? I don't know. They not only lost their home, they had three rent houses in the hurricane's path. All four were destroyed. From the air, Country Walk looks like a child's board game that ended angrily. How could, you can't live here. This is, forget my, just my house. It's no longer a neighborhood. Disaster is now the benchmark by which Nick and Maureen measure their lives. I just didn't want to leave this way. We know? were the second ones to move in this development. The only yeah. four walls they will have now is a hotel room. We patched the whole roof. You ought to see that roof. They have seen none of the promised federal help. $10 million for 300,000 people, added up in dollars and cents. It's like milk, bread, and maybe a sandwich. For most, Hurricane Andrew will become a faded clipping in the memory. The Pascarellos can't live long enough to forget this. My daughters got married from here, and we were the first ones to move in the area. And I just didn't want to leave this way, you know. I wanted to leave with a happy memory. Too much has been moved already. Bob Dotson, NBC News, Country Walk, Florida.
President Bush canceled his weekend in Maine and said today he'd monitor the Florida relief efforts by commuting between Camp David and the White House. He's been criticized because the operation has been slow and disorganized. NBC's John Cochran at the White House. How's the president handling the flack? Well, he's wearing his flight jacket again, Stone. He wears it a lot these days. You know, when this hurricane first hit, White House Chief of Staff Jim Baker sent word out to federal agencies that this time, no one was going to be able to accuse George Bush of moving too slowly. But it hasn't quite worked out that way. After a briefing from the Pentagon brass, Bush said the important thing is that well, troops are helping the homeless and the hungry, and he didn't want to get into an argument with Governor Lawton Childs over why troops weren't sent earlier. I'm not going to participate in the blame game, and nor is Governor Childs. But on the Today program, Childs said he asked for federal troops immediately after the hurricane hit. We asked for medical uh, people, uh, two medical battalions. It took three days uh, and, uh, to get that. Uh, so we were asking for troops. The president's top relief official in Florida tells a different story. As soon as Governor Childs made the request for our federal troops to come in and assist, we acted on that request. The request reached the White House yesterday afternoon. Why didn't Bush send troops earlier without waiting to be asked? He cannot do that unilaterally. It has to come through the governor's office. That's not exactly correct. Bush could have sent troops on Monday, the day he went to Florida. Bush has the legal authority. But it is a long-standing custom not to infringe on a governor's authority, except in extreme cases, such as the civil rights struggles 30 years ago. And Bush did offer federal troops. And I am ready, uh, if necessary, to move in units of the U.S. Armed Forces to provide any emergency services. The next day, Tuesday, Bush campaigned in the Midwest, thinking all was going well in Florida. But by the time he toured storm-damaged areas in Louisiana on Wednesday, Bush was hearing that Florida was in much worse shape than first believed. Bush then sent Secretary Card to Florida, and he privately reported that the federal help from civilian agencies was hopelessly inadequate. Troops were dispatched last night. And today, the President and Governor Childs got on the phone with each other and agreed there would be no more finger pointing. They thought it would be unseemly for them to be swapping accusations at a time stone when people are suffering down there. John, what kind of lasting effect do you think this will have on the president's re-election campaign in Florida? My guess is right now not much because it's not seen that he was particularly moving slowly, at least with the, the federal troops. That's kind of muddy as to who was at fault there. And even now, Governor Childs is saying, well, uh, the president acted uh, properly on this. This is late in the day. The problem is that the civilian agency down there, the Federal Emergency Management Agency called FEMA, is quite unpopular. In the past, it's been unpopular. Hurricane, uh, Hurricane U uh, Hugo down in South Carolina at the time of the San Francisco earthquake, FEMA got very bad reviews. It's getting bad reviews this time. It's a federal agency. George Bush is the commander in chief. That could hurt. John Cochran at the White House. Thank you, John. When Nightly News continues, the latest on Somalia and on America Close Up tonight, the school of tomorrow, more like a daycare center. 28 times as governor of Arkansas. Clinton didn't call the president a liar outright, but he did compare the president to a familiar puppet. Let me say one thing about taxes. Old Bush looked like Pinocchio at the Republican convention talking about taxes. I'm surprised his nose didn't grow and tump him right over in the orchestra pit when he was talking down in Houston. Saying, oh, how much I raised taxes and how little he did. Let me tell you something, folks. My state's got the second lowest tax burden in America, and when we raise money, we put it in trust funds for education and for roads, and my folks supported it because they got what they paid for. White House spokesman Marlon Fitzwater countered.